I believe so. I remember it was it was new. First That's Friday really was a new cool. thing. I didn't know that. There you go. Thank you for sharing that. No worries. Her new single, Cause You Love Me, is coming soon. No. <gasps> oh, no. I'm sorry. <laughs> Welcome to Room 6, the channel dedicated to the local music scene and the people that make it, including me and my guest. And my guest is a blues singer, guitarist, pianist, music teacher, and community builder focused on inclusion. Also, fellow First Friday veteran, we played a show together the second First Friday ever, I believe. Wow, was Never. it? I believe so. I remember it was it was new. First That's Friday really was a cool. new thing. I didn't know that. There you go. Thank you for sharing that. No worries. Her new single, Cause You Love Me, is coming soon. No. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Her new single, Lover. <clears throat> Lover. Yes. Her new single, Lover, is coming soon, and she'll be performing it here on the channel, up in room six. So stick around to the end of the interview, uh, because it's awesome. Please welcome to the channel, Lisa Mack. Thank you. Say Thank hi. Thank you very much. You do, it, and hi. we do want to go with Lisa Mack, right? Not, oh, yeah. Not the whole name. Yeah. Okay, cool. So, welcome to the channel. Welcome to room six. Thank you. Ching. Mm. Lovely, lovely room six water. Well, thank you for bringing up Cause You Love Me. That's actually out where everybody can hear it right now. Right on. I apologize. I You may have to update a few things because that's what I found. But then again, I wrote these notes a while ago because we were supposed to do this a while ago. Yeah, I only pulled the trigger on releasing the song last week. So that's when I went and ah, updated okay. you know, my Spotify bio and my website yeah. and everything to this say that written, the song is coming out. We, we talked about this like over a month ago, I think. At least. Yeah, honestly, we've been planning to do this interview for years. Yes. Literally years. So, so. She was one of the first people I reached out to. And unfortunately, life was in the way. So, But uh, speaking of years and years ago... <clears throat> You started a union in 2015. A union? Yeah. You posted, uh, like, union, now taking union dues. Oh, yeah. Nobody who nobody who replied to that was serious. They thought I was really joking. So mm. I did not start a union, but I'm really glad that you saw that and that you appreciated it. Um, what was let it me about? Think about? Let me think about it. Okay. People were talking about how much artists get paid. And they were saying that after, I believe this was after COVID when live music started again, everybody was saying that people were starting to take 50 and hundred dollar gigs when they used to get paid more like $200 or more per event. And, you know, people were talking back and forth about what the problem is and what the solution is. And, you know, I mean, I guess everybody just really thought I was joking and that didn't go anywhere, but I'm happy to say that live music did get back to normal. Well, <laughs> I think pretty quickly. Yeah. I mean, for me, things are, are better than they were before COVID, but I, I guess I couldn't speak for everybody. Yeah. You've been playing your butt off. Yes, definitely this weekend, especially it's been really crazy. I have been doing some, some bigger gigs that are on the strip that are like major places where there's lots of tourists and lots of new people. And it's been really intense. Honestly, it's been very cool. Yeah. And that's a good problem to have if you're a musician and you're trying to pay the bills with it is to be having to like turn down gigs even because you're so busy. Yeah. Um, I'm, I, I aspire to that with YouTube. Yeah. By the way, subscribe. <laughs> um, speaking of which, if you want to be on the channel, whether reviewed, interviewed or both, Hit me up using my email address down in the description or click on the Room 6 social media link. That's also where you can find ways to support the channel, such as buying merch on room6.shop, becoming one of my Patreon patrons for as little as a dollar a month. You get patron-only content. And also I have two CDs out of my own. So it all helps to you know make help me make better videos and also help me help the scene with things like the Room 6 Rocks uh, showcases that I put on occasionally. Um, back to the show. Back to the interview. So, you went from Utah to Las Vegas to Utah to Las Vegas, right? Um, not so much. I am from Utah. Right. And I started performing in Las Vegas after I'd been living in California for a few months. And it's kind of a dramatic story, but I left California and came back to Las Vegas. And I tried to 
you know, put down roots there, tried to get a place and everything. But because of my kids, I had to actually reside in Utah. And so I spent a lot of years trying to deal with that legal situation and uh, what was going on with my kids at the time and still performing, you know, the best paying gigs that I could get that were weddings and conventions and things like that and still taking those gigs, even though I couldn't be here full time. Um, so I actually just moved here three months ago and since then I've actually been performing full time. And so that's why it's been getting a little bit crazier recently and getting a little bit more intense because I'm actually booked up every weekend now. Friday, Saturday, Sunday, every, you know, pretty much every day that I could have a gig, I've had a gig, and it's been, it's been amazing, honestly. That's awesome. Um, I'd like to go back in time a little bit with you. Let's talk about the earliest musical influence. And what I mean that is, what was that moment that you're like, I want to do that, whether it was a song or an artist or just a genre in particular? The very first thing... I would have to say it was probably like the little mermaid because I would lock myself in the bathroom and sing the little mermaid song and try to get that vibrato and that intonation. And I didn't know what I was doing, but I just knew that I was, if I practiced it enough, I could do it. And that kind of carried through to maybe the next one or two years. I got a hold of a CD from my older sisters called the great ladies sing the blues. And it had Nina Simone and Ella Fitzgerald and, just tons of, of very influential people. And I remember hearing, you know, specifically one song called I Know How It Feels to Be Lonely. And it sounded like a man singing. It was Morgana King. And it, I just wanted to be able to produce those sounds. And I just practiced and just kept doing it so much until I could, until I knew all the words, until I knew every up and down of all of those songs. And... You know, I've, I've done that with every artist that I've got kind of obsessed with ever since, where I just, I want to sing that song. I want to hear it over and over and over again until I feel like I can do that. And um, so really that's what gives me the ability to do what I do now. That's awesome. No one's ever answered that question with bathroom singing, which <laughs> is a great room for vocals. Mm -hmm. It is. It's the neck. perfect yeah. room for vocals. And I just thought nobody could hear me. And I was four. <laughs> I was four years old. I had no idea, you know, that everybody could obviously hear me. I was yeah. being very loud. But, um, you know, my stepmom would hear me outside the door and she would sit there and listen. And she got me voice lessons and she pushed me forward with it. And she told me I could record myself on cassette tapes and try to send it to record labels. And, mm. you know, everything that I said I wanted to do, she, she pushed me forward with it. So I'm very grateful for all that. Awesome. Uh, now you see kids, there were these things called cassette tapes. It's an old joke. I used to sing for a cover band, uh, various places around town. Did it for seven years. Brown Eyed Girl many, many times. And it, and we had the best name ever. I was so proud that I came up with this name. It's called Revolving Door. Mm -hmm. And it, we started as a seven piece, ended up as a four piece, went through about five keyboard players, ended up with no keyboard players, and went through seven drummers, ended up back on drummer number two. So it was one of those things like me and the lead guitars were the only original members. <laughs> And uh, it was, like you said, eventually suddenly you realize, wait, we're playing for 50 bucks as a band. What happened? And and there was, I remember that time frame you're talking about. I remember Joey Vitell, local legend of Joey Vitell, posting, stop taking gigs for 100 bucks. And that might have been what I was replying to on that post that you're talking about is because... I saw everybody was concerned, mm -hmm. <clears throat> you know, people that were making a living making music weren't making a living doing it anymore. And I was very lucky to have a lot of students that I was able to do video lessons with and kind of carry me through whatever weirdness there was, you know, when there was no gigs at all. But, but as of now, it seems like the gigs that I'm doing now aren't really uh, affected by that. So you know, I guess I'm just very lucky to have that. I do remember the first shows right after quarantine. It didn't matter what you played. It was a packed house. Mm -hmm. You could do no wrong. And it, and it was like... Everyone was just so excited to get out of their house. Every venue was yes. just printing money. You know? <clears throat> and and um, it, I, I want to say it's, it's true. However, I just went to a show. In fact, the band I'm interviewing tomorrow uh, on the channel, 
was they're they're out of town. They're here for a week, and I managed to snag an interview with them. And they're coming here. I'm so so, so excited. Uh, and they were headlining a show at Triple B's at Backstage Bar and Billiards. And it was a Friday night. No, I'm sorry. It was Saturday. But it was also when we were young. It was the night when we were young got canceled because of the wind. Mm-hmm. This was when we were emo. <laughs> and it was cute. It like a nice little play. They, they, they played it up really well. But the place was almost empty. It was, I've never been in that, that venue with less than, you know, 100 people. And this was easily like less than 20. It was really weird, but it was intimate, and we had a fun time, and um, especially in the green room. But it really felt like, oh no, are we going back to it? Some, you know, sometimes good, sometimes bad. But it was all because the when we were young thing was happening, and then when it got canceled, and all of a sudden it's like, wait, you can go see All American Rejects at Soul Belly Barbecue, or you can go see this band. You know, there was just a lot going on. Yeah, it, yeah, it was a lot going on, <clears throat> and, and I get it. If you can go see those your, those bands that that really helped you along your your childhood. Or go see, you know, local acts. They the, the natural thing is, well, I'm never going to see them again, probably. And, and you, you, you live here, kind of thing. So it, that's always a, a weird thing. Uh, but we made as a as a, a venue of, of people, we made it work, and it, it actually ended up being a really cool full night. So I'm looking forward to the interview tomorrow. But I digress. I definitely can't discount having like the value of having a small audience because I've had obviously tons of very small audiences in my more than seven years of performing. And if there's somebody that connects with your music really, really deeply, that's way more valuable than having 20 different people who tipped you and requested a song, but won't remember you. And, you know, I went through that these last two nights where the first night that I performed at the Mandalay Bay this weekend, it was just regular. It was normal. People were probably staying home because it was really windy. And then the second night, there was lots of people there. It was really exciting, and there's lots of people requesting. And they just, they might not all remember you, but if there's someone who's there and listening, and they're the only one, and they're really connecting with you, talking to you, then that could mean that they're going to be your fan for life. So, you know, that's definitely not a bad thing. And a lot of artists don't really recognize the value of those really intimate connections, like you said. Agreed. Um, And and I think a lot of musicians, especially during quarantine, kind of parlayed that into like suddenly they're on TikTok or musically and then TikTok. And they gained a lot of followers and fans. But the question is, how many do they actually know? How many would actually come to a show? Whereas, you know how easy it is on TikTok to be like, oh, cool, scroll. Oh, cool, scroll. And it's not the same as I bought your merch or something like that. And that's why the most important thing for artists is actually to own their audience in an email list rather than having TikTok own it on their platform. Agreed. Or or I guess now a social media list. Any social media. Yeah. Any social media, your email list is going to be more valuable than that because those are the people that really stand for you. I remember having an email list at a show, and somebody wrote at and their their handle, and I was like, "What the heck's that?" Because <laughs> I'm old. Um, so you have, you have a guitar named Flaka. Oh, Flaka got sold a long time ago. Oh. It's great that you remember her because I got that guitar at a thrift store, an antique store in Boulder City, and I used to perform in Boulder City a lot because that was just one of the ones that I could book for myself before I got signed up with a talent agency that was going to book for me, and. I was doing a lot of work, honestly, to book my own shows, calling all kinds of venues and just trying to make it happen. And um, I would spend a lot of time, you know, going out to these places and trying to contact people. And one of these times that I was either performing or trying to book myself some shows, I went out to the thrift store, got Flocka. It was very skinny, electric, acoustic, and I really loved that guitar. But I had just started performing and Like I was saying, I had to go back and forth to St. George all the time because um, the situation with my kids, I honestly, um, you know, I don't, I don't think necessarily people want to hear too much of a downer energy about a custody situation with my kids. But the truth is that I fought for years to get them protected from somebody who was abusive to them. And at this point we've achieved that and we're able to move here. So as hard as it is to talk about that in an interview, like it is important for me to say that like 
we won. But during the battle, I had no money. I bought this flaca and I did not have any money. I didn't have money to invest in another guitar for myself, even though I needed it for my performances. And so to start doing that, you know, it was a really good step for me. And I loved that guitar and I had to sell it because I was so broke. I, at some point I had to sell it. Then they're done that. So, you know, it's, it's cool to see now, you know, that we've basically won with that situation. And now that I'm winning a little bit more with my music career, like I have a guitar stand that holds five guitars and it can be full now full of beautiful, healthy guitars, and it's wonderful. So, yeah, cheers to that. Hey, here's to hanging in there and coming out the other side. <laughs> exactly. Um, I really did. I never thought I'd have a guitar wall. Now, granted, every guitar up there is less than 200 bucks when I bought it. But that's yeah, also because but that's I'm not, okay. I, I'm you not the guy. You don't have to qualify who, it. Yeah. You got that. You got a whole wall full of guitars. Yeah. I never thought I'd have an electric drum set and an electric piano, too, while I was at it. Yeah, it's very cool. I love the studio up there. It's very cool. Thank you. Um, we're going to take a quick... I normally call this a booze break, but we're going to take a quick uh, little refreshment <laughs> break, because it's warm. It's still Vegas, and even though it's not summer anymore, these lights get hot. So, um, libation... Or no, refreshment break. <laughs> we're back. So, throats are wetter. Things will get better. So we talked about early musical influence. We talked about many things. I wanted to talk favorite show memory. Somebody came up on the stage with their pizza, and it was just some, some hot girl coming up on the stage with pizza and trying to eat the pizza and be on the mic, and I took a selfie with her, and it was just, it felt like it was all such a good energy for making music because the audience was so happy to be there, and they felt so comfortable there, and they were really just partying like it was just in somebody's backyard, and, you know, that's that's really what it's all about, honestly. That's awesome. All right, last question. You made it. Yay. Let's pretend we're talking to little Lisa. Okay? Little Lisa singing in the bathroom. What we're doing is we're talking to new musicians, really. The ones who say, how do I be like you? What is one thing you wish someone had told you before you started down this twisted road that is music? This is a question I ask of all my friends. As somebody who has taught a lot of students in voice, piano, and guitar, I've had a lot of music students, and I love that experience of being able to help somebody see their own passion and really get better with their own talent and then be proud of themselves because they got better. So the thing that I would tell anybody who's starting out in music is to just start and start doing it as much as you can every day even if it's five minutes 10 minutes 20 minutes you do it every time you can and that will add up to your 10,000 hours that will add up to you being better than anybody else as long as you have the passion and the will to decide to do it in those off moments when you don't have anything else to do you sit down with your guitar you sit down and write a song. It doesn't matter if it's shitty. It doesn't matter how good it is. It just matters that you did it and that the tomorrow you're going to do it again. And then the next day you're going to do it again. And eventually one of those is going to make you really proud. And you're going to decide that it's worth sharing. So all you have to do is just put in the time. I couldn't say it any better. And, and if you think about it, the artists that you are blown away by and that you remember are the ones who put in the repetition so that when they get on stage, they're not worried about, am I playing this right? They're worried about, am I connecting with people? And, you know. Absolutely. And that's something I was thinking about at my gig last night. I was really, because this is something that somebody in the industry told me. Um, I talked with somebody who was Taylor Swift's manager at a music conference, and he oh. helped her really blow up. And I had the opportunity to ask him questions about my career and what he thought about my music after he heard me perform. And it was really inspiring to be able to talk to people like this. But he told me that what I needed to do was open my eyes when I'm performing and connect with my audience. And as much as you don't want to hear the one thing that you need to practice and do, that's the one thing you need to practice and do. And I really tried to do that last night. And it really hit, you know, when you look at people as you're singing, you're connecting with them. And when you're connecting with them, they are becoming your fan. And that's really, 
what the business part of it is all about is you need those fans or you don't have the music career. So, you know, you got to get their email address. You got to tell them when your next single is coming out. You got to tell them what action they need to take to support you. And then just keep doing it every day, every single day. And that's, that's actually very, extremely true, the whole opening your eyes. Because when you think about it, Taylor Swift never sings with her eyes closed almost ever. But No, professionals mostly yeah. do not. But, you know, you feel emotional or you feel like you're concentrating and you close your eyes, and that's fine. People have really enjoyed my performances where I had my eyes closed almost the entire time. But if you want to go to the next level, you mm -hmm. have to know what those things are and practice, and then you get to that next level. Yep. And it's something that the rare times I do perform, I try to myself to remember, you know, uh, they're watching you, so watch them back. Because my wife and I just actually came back from a cruise. Short tangent, but it's germane, I promise. And we had a, a rare moment. My kid is 14, but for some reason couldn't make it past 9 p.m. before he wanted to go to sleep. It was like, light, late. So my wife and I are on the cruise ship looking for stuff to do. And, of course, we did karaoke one night. That was amazing. And of course, of course, went and saw, you know, big band play and, and some other stuff. And we're like, we're looking on the list and, well, there's a guy playing piano at this bar. And there's some girl playing guitar. And it literally says piano and guitar. And we said, why not both? So we go see the guy playing piano. He's, when I say he's playing songs wrong, he's playing like piano man. He's playing it like a dirge. And he's like reworking. I was like, no, people want to hear piano man. That made me so sad. Yeah. you Seriously, we were behind him. He's he's reading an iPad. He's reading the lyrics. He's like, come on, buddy. And and we didn't even enter the bar because of how he sounded. We're like, okay, let's go check out Scotty Better. We go to, so we go to an Irish pub. She was great. But she did one song, sang to the ceiling the whole time, stops, tells her, and proceeds to talk for the, like, the next 15 minutes about how... When the cruise is over, she's going back to deliver a mail in Canada or whatever. Wait, we don't care. Sing and look at us. But she she was singing to the ceiling the whole time. And I get like, you're into it, yeah, nah, 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 but you got to open your eyes. You know, you, you got to at least face the audience. So it all matters. Um, and my wife accused me of being too industry. I was like, no, it's just, are you enjoying this? <laughs> you know, so... Pay attention well, to what people do on stage if that's, you know, and find what resonates with you. Well, when you're performing, the intention is to connect with the audience. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not about you and what you want. It's really about them and that they're having a good time. And as an artist, you want to make the songs that you want to make and make the sounds that you want to make. And that's fine. But if you intend to make money from it and make it your career then you do have to realize that it is an industry. And if people don't like your music and they don't like the way it's making them feel, then you're not going to end up getting paid for it. Exactly. And if you're getting paid to play cover songs, at least make it sound sort of like a cover song. <laughs> um, yeah, if that feeling isn't there. You know, he, he definitely in that moment was just trying to get through, you know, and clock yeah. out and go home, which... I have definitely oh. felt that way one time or two times in my life, <laughs> but it, it was, you still have to think yeah. about how you're making the people around you feel or you're not doing your job. I think part of it is that we had just come from hearing an amazing big band play mm -hmm. and we're like, feeling good. <laughs> and then we go and we're like, ah. Uh, anyway, thank you so much for watching. Thank you for coming on the channel. Stick around. We're going to see Lisa upstairs in room six performing New song Lover coming out, and something else, Mary, maybe. Uh, in the meantime, remember to be awesome and amazing and make music, not excuses. And uh, we'll see you upstairs. Later. Thank you.
Mando.